It's top of the hour. Let's get rolling. Nice. All right. We're in like Flynn. So this is uh, kind of a um, ceremonious episode. This is our 25th anniversary episode. Right. It's the it Baseline episode. Tech Talk. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> More on that topic another time. So welcome to episode 25 of Baseline Tech Talk Tuesday. Today, we're going to be talking about winterization some of the basics how-tos, and then of course, how baseline fits into that equation and some of the tips and tactics you can put into play to utilize your baseline controller uh, for winterizing. And before we kick it off, just wanna have a couple quick introductions. I'm Andy Humphrey, RSM for the Northeast. We have Chris Wright, VP of Sales, and we have Dan Conger, our training manager. And for anyone joining us for the first time, you can catch all the previous 24 episodes on the YouTube channel. And the handle is Baseline Web Training. It's all one word, Baseline Web Training. Search for that on YouTube and you can find all the previous episodes as well as the additional content that Dan's been creating with how-to tips. And I think last week he produced one on how to install a rain sensor and the different right. methods for connecting a rain sensor to a baseline controller, which is a right. pretty common question. So yeah, with that, Dan, let's uh, turn it over to you to kick us off with winterization. Cool. Okay. Well, it's getting kind of cold in here all of a sudden. <laughs> no, I, I'm still wearing shorts here in California. So, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, winterization and, and so many of us, so many folks are going to think about blowout and that's kind of what I think about, but there's definitely some steps to it. And there's some other things as Andy brought up that, that are going to tie in baseline. So I'm going to, uh, share screen and show you, I've got a, a little bit of, if you aren't careful, you're going to, you're going to get, it's going to get too late in the season where, uh, you have snow on the ground and you're still have water in your system and it could be catastrophic. Mm. Too late in the season. This has already happened. (laughs) This is September 8th in Colorado. So snow has already flown. And that is why we uh, started thinking about doing an episode on winterization. So believe it or not, it's that time of year. So, so, so to, to a good question for me is just because there's snow on the ground doesn't necessarily mean that it's disastrous, right? It, it's, it's definitely a, a good indication of, of something that's coming though. True. Yep. But so, we can use the technology to uh, get a better indicator as to what's going on at pipe level. Oh, or like what's going on in the soil. Exactly. So this was, this was another indicator that we talked about and, this is actually uh, on Chris's on site with you. Um, yep. This is a soil moisture sensor, which also has a built-in temp sensor. And I thought this was really fascinating. So I've got it set for a 30-day period right now. And what looks like August 25th, we had a high soil temperature of 83.3 degrees. And then later in the month, we had an extreme low of almost 62 degrees, 61.7. But this big drop off here, this was uh, what, September 7th at 76. And then two days later, pretty dramatic, uh, pretty dramatic change there. And, and Chris, what, what, what was going on in, in this, that interval there where that yeah, had that big drop off? Just a very strong cold front came through straight mm-hmm. out of uh, the north up in Canada and it uh, cooled us right off. Also yeah. produced uh, hurricane force winds right. and uh, generated uh, substantial snowfall in Wyoming and some in Colorado. And is that when you were off the grid for 36 hours or so? Yeah. <laughs> Had no power. <laughs> yeah. So, and then also seeing that the rest of it, it didn't, it didn't uh, pick back up. So that's a really good indicator of what's going on in the soil, not air temperature, but soil temp, soil temperature, which I think is, important to remember here. So I'm going to come back to my my slides here. So if you aren't too late, um, let's talk about some of the steps that that you'd want to take on winterizing your system. And and I think the first one we want to do is is just shut off that water supply. So it's going to, you know, close off your your meter, your ball valve, or whatever your supply line is. If you've got a tank, we want to shut that down. Um, And then if you have a backflow preventer, we're going to shut that down because that does two things, right? Where that's might be your water supply, but for blowing out a system, that's going to be an important step that we have that backflow preventer or that 
backflow prevention device, whether it's an RP, you know, a, a dual check, whatever that is, that you have that shut down. So the next next step then is is for most most folks, it's going to be blowing out the lines. And the hardware that people really like to use for that is a, a high volume, low pressure. And that's generally uh, a tow behind air compressor. And I've since I don't no blowing out systems, just from my talking with other people. I know these from in here in California, uh, jackhammers for di digging holes for trees. <laughs> so, um, so high pressure, uh, high volume, low pressure. And the idea is that it's not much more than 50 PSI because we want to just move, move the water out of the system and replace it with the air, but we don't want the air to compress because air is very compressible. And when it comes out, it can be explosive and damage all sorts of uh, well, items as it comes out. And the key is that air is compressible, but water is not. So if yeah. you put too much air pressure behind it, then it's gonna accelerate your water and can create a significant water hammage, water hammer damage. Oh, I like that word, hammage. Perfect. Hammage, sorry, yeah. <laughs> So this, the, uh, your air supply source, we're gonna connect that after backflow preventer or backflow prevention device, but before that first valve, um, but not through that uh, RP or that, that dual check, not through that device. It's two things, we don't wanna damage the device and those ports are just way too small. So then you're gonna turn on that very first zone. Actually, you're gonna activate that first zone then turn on the air compressor. And again, the idea is we don't want to compress any of the air. So the valve's already open, the zone's active, then we start feeding air through there and it will, and we're going to just slowly kind of wrap that in. And this is where, this is um, one of the places where mobile access could be really valuable, right? So now I've got my phone or mobile device and I can go through my zones one by one and just turn them on one by one until I run them long enough till I start seeing uh, no more water and I start to get that mist spraying out. So I've got the majority of the water out of the lines. So I could go through, use mobile access, turn on one, turn on the next. I can actually run multiple zones with mobile access. The other way we could do it is since we have 99 different programs available on a base station 3200, um, we could set a dedicated blowout program and activate that and set the run times and just let it run and then make walk around and, and visualize that and see what's going on. Yeah, a couple uh, things I might mention there, Dan. You know, oftentimes programs are set up uh, because of the plant type and the, you know, micro environments on the site. They're not always set up in, in particular orders. And then if you ran your zones one through 50, that might not also be in order that you'd want to blow out your system. And right. so oftentimes we'll see people set up a special program for blowout that'll move the water down the hydraulic uh, infrastructure in the right way to, to press it out versus starting at the end and then running a zone at the beginning and then in the middle. They'll set it up so that it runs in the sequence that they're looking to move the water out of the line. That's a good, I hadn't really thought about that. That absolutely makes sense because you were trying to move water all the way out of the system and all the way through, not water in a particular manner because zone order has no bearing on the hydraulics in your system. Right. It's very good. Yeah. So once, once you, you got your last zone and you're blowing mist through there, you've got most of the water out or 90% of the water out, you're going to shut off the compressor, then shut off the zone. Last time, kind of repeat this is we don't want to leave compressed air in there. We just want to uh, shut off the air source and then shut down the zone. So, okay. So we've got the majority of the water out of our system. What's, what's next? We need to protect the devices. So this is just a good reminder is all devices that are above ground are susceptible to damage. So if we have a backflow prevention device, if we have a hose bib, we have any water supply in there, we need to, need to protect those. So if we do have a backflow prevention device, like a, uh, an RP or a dual check or anything like that, um, we need to drain the water out of that one. And we want to make sure that all the ball valves are in the part way open position. So that's the test cocks, the ball valves itself. 
um, there's, you know, in a, in a one inch or even in a two inch ball valve, there's just a tablespoon of water. And if that ball valve is closed, it will absolutely crack uh, the body of the preventer. And so my own ex- my only experience I have with freeze, <clears throat> pardon me, I had one night where it got to 18 degrees for just a couple of hours, had a ball valve closed and it cracked the, the brass and just opened it up. <clears throat> Minor, you know, not, not dramatic damage that other people would see, but um, it can happen. So if we've got the backflow um, and the test cocks open, flow sensors in the ground are gonna be fine. That's, there's no issues there. The thing that we do need to watch out for is the pressure transducers. So um, the pressure transducer itself will be fine if there's no water in it. So if we have the pressure transducer in the up position where the transducers at the top of the T or the top of the device and pointing up, we've blown the air through there, it's gonna be in good shape. However, it's, if it's inverted and the pressure transducer is in the down position and it's obviously gonna collect water, it's definitely going to damage that, that small amount of water that might be residual in there. It will damage that device when it freezes. Now, if it's sitting horizontally uh, crossways, you're probably taking a risk. So my suggestion in that case, either if it's pointing down or sideways, is then you're going to want to spin out that device and remove that. So that's definitely not the preferred method. Uh, having it upright is always going to be easier for you. And will will freeze damage be covered under the baseline warranty? We've got ten years, so the answer is no. No, short freeze answer. Damage no. would not be covered under the baseline warranty. Right, freeze damage is not something you can protect like lightning damage, where you can actually put something in place to prevent it. Freeze damage is a human responsible by the humans. <laughs> right, right, by the two leggings. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is also a good time to go out to your valve box and take a look at your splices in your valve boxes, right? So points up on your splices is always a good idea. If, you've, if we've got points down, that's a great collection point. Um, whether you have moisture in the box now or in the spring, that's a great way to introduce water into your electrical system, which will cause you problems later on. So just go around. You know, some of the things that, that Dan's talking about and that we're going to mention, you might be thinking, gosh, I don't always have this much time when I'm on a site to do these yeah. things. And, and you, you might be right. And what we're trying to do is, is give you some tips that you can either um, add to your services or some things if you do have time that you can document. So you can try to add value uh, to your clients. So I guess I'm speaking to any contractors that might be on the call today. So that if you're just doing a basic winterization, maybe you're competing with somebody else and you're just providing a commodity of blowout. But if you can provide some extra value, i.e. opening the valve boxes, checking out the splices like Dan was talking about, and some other things that we're going to mention that you may be able to increase the value and increase your, your service line by doing some of these things. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Value add. How are you, how are you better than the other person and, and uh, not just be all things being equal? Nice. Okay, so we've got our devices protected. Wonderful. Um, that's going to vary site by site. But now we can start looking at the controller. So this is a great time to, since you're on site, let's back up the controller. You aren't going to see it for a couple of months. So you can back it up right to base manager or you can back, back up to a USB drive that you should be carrying with you, right? So carry a USB drive and you can back up multiple controllers on one USB drive because they all have unique uh, serial numbers. Mm -hmm. And we're well aware that these controllers, you know, there could be 10 or more years old. And we know that a high percentage of them are not connected to base manager. So this is a great time if your controllers stand alone to perform the backup. Yeah. Yep. And weird things can happen over the winter months that uh, may create a catastrophic failure. And if you don't have your programming backed up, it could create more work in the spring and you lose data, mm -hmm. i.e. a snowplow takes out one of your controllers. <laughs> yep. And tell your, tell your customer what you're doing because this is, has value. All right. Mm -hmm. Right. Excellent. And then it's not just the programming, right? There's a configuration as well. The zone assignments and all that sensor yeah. information. That's, that's all in that backup. So absolutely. So this is also a good time to take a look at the firmware version. Um, this is an opportunity to 
update the firmware on the controller. So that's also mm -hmm. good to do. Now, once you've addressed that, now you're going to turn the controller off. And we absolutely suggest that you do not power the controller down, that you leave it powered up. But you don't want it to run, so you're going to turn it to off. Mm -hmm. Two ways you can do that. First one, turn the dial to the off position. Okay. Here, the other, ver other way to do it is go into base manager and to go to remote off, as you can see my, my screenshot that I have here. Here's the benefit of doing, well, I, I actually give you the negative of doing the dial position. If you turn it, the dial position off and it, when you're ready to turn it back on or you want to run it or anything, you got to actually come back to the controller, unlock it, open it, and turn the dial back to run position. If you do a remote off via base manager, you can turn it at the controller, you can turn it back on, or remotely you can turn it back on. So you can do it either way. So definitely, I think doing a remote off through base manager is absolutely the more flexible way of treating it. Yep, unless, um, again, uh, as designed, it's the field users you know, override, so they have assurance that nobody remotely is gonna turn it on. So if that's what you're looking for, turn it to off in the field and it can't be overridden remotely. True. That's a good point, you're right. The only way to do it is to come out there. Okay. I guess it kind of depends on who's who all's in the controller, right? If you're if you're the only person that will ever be in the controller, you know it's not going to happen. But if there's an off chance that someone might run it, that could be an issue. Sure. Um, so these are some. So Andy, if we have the controller um, off but still operating, what kind of data, what kind of, what kind of information can you get out of that? What would might be? Yeah. So uh, pretty much all the same data as you would have if it was the summertime. So you'll get your electrical um, checks, you'll get your uh, moisture data, you'll get your temperature data, any of the, the devices that are connected to the system will continue to collect data. And that can be interesting to see uh, both in the fall, maybe when that grass really does move into dormancy. So for cool season grasses, that's around 50 degrees. You can kind of see when is that happening. So you can continue to use your controller maybe for agronomic purposes. Mm -hmm. And then as well in the spring, even if you haven't turned the water on yet, you can still have that sort of a microscope into the soil to see what it's doing both moisture and temperature wise to see when it's starting to wake up again, both for agronomic purposes uh, and for watering purposes. I, I, I really like that the, the temperature agronomic con, uh, interconnect, because I think that uh, we have an idea on what, when, when roots are going to start being active when plant material, but we're just kind of taking a guess based off of air temperature, but now we're seeing exactly what the soil's doing rather than a, when a guess. Yeah, it could be that um, agronomically, maybe May 5th is the first day the turf wakes up, you know, depending if it's a late season or where you are geographically, or maybe it's April 5th. And so we should really be using the data that's available to us to make those decisions instead of just turning the controller on because it fit in the turn on schedule. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And in the, the high desert uh, arid regions in the winter time, um, evergreens sometimes need water during the winter. So you can um, use your sensor to get moisture data and temperature data to know if you need to roll a, a water truck to go and apply water to evergreens. Nice. It's very true. Interesting. Okay. Um, so we've addressed the controller. Um, now it's a good idea to take some notes for the spring. So um, maybe, maybe we, there's a, some a bad splices or that's not even a bad splice I'm showing you. That was a, a disaster of a splice. But you know, if there's a, an ugly splice that, that you didn't have time to address, put that in your notes so you, you can catch up for spring. Um, and then this poor guy on the right, that's just, he's going down hard. Um, man, Dan, I thought that was you in 1998. <laughs> <laughs> and the acid wash jeans. And, and it's great. That's actually classic on several levels, isn't it? Um, Dunkin donuts. I think you've got to know that's East coast right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's not California. That's for sure. <laughs> so what I was thinking about was, let's say you're, you're still irrigating and well, like that, the, the, the uh, Colorado shot that we started off with, you're still irrigating. Um, the plant material isn't dormant yet, but you get a cold, a cold freeze. 
or you get a cold snap. Well, if you're irrigating, your sidewalks are going to ice over because they're wet. Well, using a baseline air temperature sensor and then setting up a uh, stop condition in the controller, you can say when it drops below 35 degrees, stop all irrigation. And you could do that. Well, that might be something if, you, if that caught you with your pants down, so to speak, this year, put it in your notes and then put it on your, your wish list or your to-do list for next season and avoid that, avoid that from happening. Um, maybe you've got some pending repairs, um, that pressure transducer, you want to change the position back to the right position. That, so next year you don't have to yank it out. That would also be good. Um, maybe you didn't get to an update on the controller. You know, those are things to put in your notes for next season. So, uh, when you come back to the spring startup, so, um, this quite honestly, I think this takes, takes us back to full circle to our, one of our very early uh, tech talks was on spring startup and updating firmware. And I think that would, that kind of, that's kind of the circular loop on this one as brings us back. Yeah. You know, again, was you, our first one. Was it actually our first? I believe it was. Yeah. Or was it two wire? No, it was two wire. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right. It was early though. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, Cause we started before startups. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, Antonia has got a good question that came in um, that's relevant. What collected field data helps determine that the root activity has started in the spring? Ah. So the soil moisture sensor has two portions to it. It has the blade that's going to collect moisture, tell you about moisture content in the soil, the black portion of it. And I apologize. I don't, oh, I got my prop back here. Like, yeah. The, the okay. decoder portion. Mm -hmm. So the decoder portion has a temperature sensor in it. This is moisture. So this is collecting temperature data. So we can, knowing soil temperature tells you a lot of information. We'll tell you how the roots are doing. Um, it'll, that's probably the biggest thing. Yeah. I can't speak to warm season grass because I spend my time in the Northeast, but I've been told that 50 degrees is when the grass starts to mm -hmm. um, come out of dormancy. Yeah. Also the, the a good indicator is to when to apply pre-emergent. That's exactly what, it, and that's something that I, yeah, that's something that, that's really critical to us here in the West. Because if you wait too long, sorry, you got weeds this season and you're going to have to do a post-emergent. Yeah. If anybody else has, uh, wants to comment on that, drop something in the, in the mm -hmm. chat or in the Q and A, if you, if you yeah. use temperature, uh, maybe from a third party device or, or what do you look for, uh, in the spring to either put pre-emergent fertilizer, et cetera, because moisture is only one piece of the, right. of the puzzle. And, and sometimes we don't need as much moisture because the plants aren't under stress. And so you can actually get by with a, with a drier soil profile in the early spring and the late fall because the plants are not under the same level of stress. Yeah. So I got a couple of questions because since, since I don't, I'm not super familiar with, with blowouts, I'm, I'm kind of curious what size compressor people use. You know, do they, how small, do they, I think you, the, what is the, I'm used to maybe a hundred CFM as a smallest toe behind, but you know, people prefer larger if they've got a three inch main line, is that even enough? Do you have to go, have to go larger? So I'd, I'd love to know, you know, if you I'm seeing some names on this list, definitely in the heart of the East Northeast, yeah. Yeah. they could provide some great feedback. Yeah. Put, uh, <laughs> put it in the chat. Yeah. Let's hear well, personal preference. Yeah. Nick, Doug, come on guys, give us some, give us some juice. <laughs> I, I know that uh, that one time I was at visiting you um, wherever I can't remember where we were and someone was just blowing out systems and he pulled into the parking lot and we we're having beers and he was pulling his compressor behind him. He's like, oh, I'm working, working 14 hour days trying to get everything blown out with with this compressor and and, and the challenges on finding compressors sometimes. So yes, I, I have heard that. 185. 185. Check. Okay. And then the other one I was kind of wondering about, are there any, are there still any gravity drain systems that are out there that people have to maintain or have they, have they capped them all off and they just go straight blowout? Because that's, I, I was looking when I, my old, old, old college irrigation manual, and it just talks about, you know, gravity drain. Like, wow. Yeah. yeah. Who's, is anybody still using King drains or blazing drains on their systems? Residentially, I think there's quite a bit of that that oh, there? happens, but commercially, I think it's, primarily gone to uh, blowout scenarios. And, and, and that, in that scenario, you have to 
pitch pitch your lines to drain and then the drain mm -hmm. I, 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 no and they, the the drains seal up under under pressure so basically every time the zone shuts off it drains a little bit too okay, and they seal kind of like up under the, pressure on drip yeah. zone sometimes we see up, up an end flush that's kind of like that i'm glad to see that this has been a very informative tech talk for dan because <laughs> <laughs> it's all about me right <laughs> Well, this is actually good info too. Nick, uh, who's up in Boston, says that on large jobs, uh, sometimes you need two compressors, which I could understand if you've got a large yeah. pipe and you need that kind of volume. Sure. Right. Absolutely. High volume, low pressure. Right. Because that, that's the whole thing, right? Because you can't just crank up the pressure and hope that you're going to get the volume of air out through there. So. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. We don't have any other questions pouring in. We're approaching our uh, stop time. So what do we have uh, coming up on uh, Tech Talk Tuesday for next week? Next week, we're going to have Frankie from Support come on and, and kind of talk about some of his top calls, things that come through support, and then definitely want to go to how to, how to avoid those. So let's make them the, the Maytag repair people of uh, and make, make, put them out of a job, make them go do something else in the company. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the more that we're aware of the types of support that's out there, the better we can prep our customers, i.e. everybody who's on the call here today, to, to try to prevent some of those from coming in. I know. That's right. Yeah. We know that uh, support load has been heavy this year, and um, it's been uh, sometimes difficult to get through and get to timely response. So if we can do things to help flatten the curve, to use a... Uh, popular uh, term nowadays uh, for support, then uh, that'll benefit us all. So with that, this will be recorded and found on our YouTube channel, as well as other um, helpful videos that uh, Dan has been producing, again, to help uh, support and flatten that curve too. So yeah. If and next week I'm I'm off, so I'll catch you guys on the the following week. Oh, cool! So we a, get to talk about Andy behind his back all next yeah. week too. That'll be good time. Awesome. Can't wait to watch that YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, let's wrap. Uh, all right, appreciate cool. everybody uh, being here and uh, joining us again. And uh, please uh, join us again next week. Uh, same same channel, same place, same time. Um, we appreciate your attention and, and participation. So go out, be safe, work hard, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Bye.